uh, to grab your Bibles and go to Genesis chapter 2. And we're going to be in reading there where God created the first man. And the title of the teaching today is The Man God Made. The Man God Made. Again, coming from Genesis chapter 2. And I'm going to start reading at verse 15 and we'll go down through verse 25 today. Genesis chapter 2, 15 through 25. The word of God says this. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden. Now, why did God put the man in the garden? He didn't just put him there. This is important. He put him there to dress it and to keep it. Do you know that the first job that a man had was the job of gardener? Yes, the job of husbandman. Husbandman. He took care of the garden. He took care of the earth. The next verse says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest eat freely, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And the Lord God said, It is not good for the man that the man should be alone. I will make a help meet for him. And out of the ground, the Lord formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. So we see that he was a cultivator, he was a husbandman, and he was a communicator. And Adam gave names to all the cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helpmeet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he, took, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man, he made a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and cleave unto his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. Again, teaching from this subject today on this awesome, beautiful Father's Day, the man God made, the man God made, the man God made. A lot of times, as guys, we say stuff that... Um, we don't really know what we're saying. We're really kind of being, you know, just facetious and funny. We say stuff like, I'm the man. I'm the man in my house. I know I've said it several times. I told Deb, listen, I'm the man in this house. And as soon as I said, I'm the man in this house, I turned around and did what she said. It's like that sometimes. But what does it mean to be a man? We're genetically, we're, we're males. But what does it mean to be a man, the man that God made? And that's what we're going to talk about today. Because we found out today that the first man that God ever made, it's, listen, one of the best things you can do in the Bible, if you are a student of the word and you study the word, pay attention to first mention. And so we went all the way back into the beginning because the purpose of a thing can always be found in the creator of the mind that created it. So God makes man and he puts him in the garden and he gives him a job. That's another thing we ought to talk about today. Go to work. The Bible says that he does not that he that does not provide for his own household, the man that doesn't provide for his own household, he's an infidel. So the first thing that God gave Adam is he gave him a job and that job involved cultivating. And then the next thing we see is that God brings all of the animals to Adam and Adam begins to speak and whatever he called them, that was the name thereof. And so we see that he's a communicator. But not only was he communicating there, if you look at um, the situation with Eve when she was tempted there in the garden. We have no biblical record, no biblical account that says that God spoke to Eve directly and communicated to her the different commands and restrictions about the garden. So it stands to reason that Adam, being the first man that was there, not only was he a cultivator, he was a communicator. And so he was a teacher. And brothers, that's what we have to recognize. We are teachers of the first order in our home. And so he was a cultivator and he was a communicator. But let's go a little bit further and let's talk about the man that God made. Because listen, the man God made is the man we want to be. Not only the man that God made, the man, the husband, and the Father. And listen, God dropped this in my spirit before we get into this, this teaching this morning. If you are watching this broadcast, you're not married yet, you're not a father yet, I don't know where, I just heard the Lord say this. He said, tell them that they can pray for their seed before it ever shows up. 
I'm going to say it again. If you are a young man out there and your desire is to have a wife, your desire is to have uh, a family, your desire is to one day be a husband. Do you know that you can start right now praying over your seed, praying over your children, even before they come into manifestation? But let's get into the word of God today. The man God made the man God made. Now, again, in Genesis chapter two and verse number 15, the Bible says that God put Adam there in the garden and he put Adam there in the garden to tend it, to make sure that all the plants grew. His first job was that of a husbandman. He cultivated the ground. And listen, let me share something with you. Anything you cultivate, my brothers, it will grow. And that's what we're supposed to do. We are cultivators by nature. We're supposed to cultivate our own personal lives. We're supposed to cultivate our wives. We're supposed to cultivate our children's lives. We are supposed to help things grow, develop, and fulfill their potential in the earth. And so if God gave Adam a job in the garden, he said, cultivate it, take care of it, maintain this garden. I call myself a little gardener, you know, but I'm not that that big of a gardener. My biggest thing is grass. I'll probably be that old dude that's sitting on the steps as an old guy sitting outside on the front porch, screaming at kids and throwing the newspaper, telling them, get off my grass, get off my grass, because I like to see a healthy lawn. I'm always walking around, checking my grass, making sure it's edged right, making sure the weeds are out, making sure it's getting watered the way that it's supposed to get watered. That's just something that I do. And so the first man that God made, listen, he was a gardener and he was a cultivator. And that means that we should be able to help things fulfill their potential. Now, if you are going to be a cultivator because the man was placed there in the Garden of Eden to dress it and to take care of it, there's a couple of things you're going to have to do. You're going to have to weed, you're going to have to water, and you're going to have to watch. You didn't hear what I just said about my grass. I go out every single morning. I guess my neighbors look at me like, what in the world is he doing? I look at almost every blade of grass. I am watching it. I am weeding it. I am watering it because I want it to grow up healthy. And so that's what we're going to talk about this morning as a cultivator. And then we're going to talk about a communicator. And then we're going to talk about that the man that God made. Listen, he prays, he provides, he protects, and he guides. But that's going to be later on. Let's talk about cultivating. Now, whenever you cultivate something, got to be careful of a couple of things. Got to make sure the weeds stay out. Got to make sure that whatever you're cultivating gets the right amount of water and you got to watch over it. Now, when you talk about keeping the weeds out of your life as a man of God, there are three different areas where you have to keep the weeds out of your life. You got to keep the weeds out of your mind. You got to keep the weeds out of your heart and you've got to keep the weeds out of your relationships. What are weeds? Weeds are things that happen in our lives that cause our potential to never be met. And so what do you mean I have to keep the weeds out of my mind? This It's a weird thing. If you are a father, a true man of God, and you are a true father, your first priority is always your family. That's what you, th I, there is not a day that goes by that I don't think about my family, that I'm not praying for my family, that I'm not thinking about the future of my family, how I can provide for my family, not only while I'm here, but while I'm gone, I've made provisions for that also. But what does that have to do with weeding and keeping the weeds out of your mind? Do you know that you can be sitting down doing nothing and the devil will come into your mind and invade your mind with, with thoughts of worry, anxiety? What if this happens? What if that happens? I'm going to show you how to defeat that in just a few moments because that comes with the, the praying, providing, protecting, and guiding. And we'll talk about that in just a few minutes. But you have to get the weeds out of your mind. And another thing you have to do when it talks about getting the weeds out of your mind Many of us were given images of what a husband and a father and a man should be that were so far removed from the word of God until it's a shame. I didn't have a father that was growing up, that was in the house with me every day, that sat down with me and taught me the do's and the don'ts of life. I didn't have a father that sat down with me, that imparted to me wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. I, I see um, guys now that have this great relationship with their father. I didn't have any of that. And so you have to be very, very careful that the image, the we, the image of a man, these are weeds in your mind, line up with the word of God. When I was a little boy, my first concept, adolescent, of becoming a man was getting to the tramp tree in Greenville, Florida. That's where all the old heads hung out under the tramp tree. 
And man, my mom would never let me go to the tram tree. And when I got to go, I figured out why. But that was like the, the, the place to go if you were a young dude going up in my little one horse town. When I got to the tram tree, guess what I found out? That at the tram tree, you get tramp knowledge. You get tramp understanding and you get tramp tree wisdom. And I realized that wasn't the way to go. And so I had a wrong image of what a man, of what a husband, of what a father should be. The image I had in the home of a father was a, a man who worked and he provided and he took care of his family. But when he came home, he gave the check to his wife and anything else he did was all, he could do whatever he wanted. And it was off limits simply because he was a provider. Can I tell you something? That was a weed in my thought process. That was a weed in my thought process. Some of you men right now, you're dealing with a weed in your thought process. And you think that that's what being a man is all about. And it is not. And so we have to get the weeds out of our mind and begin to retrain our mind and retrain our thinking with the word of God. And so with that said, I want to share something with you found in Joshua chapter one and verse number eight. Joshua chapter one and verse number eight. You got to get the weeds out of your mind. Now, that may sound like it's insignificant, but I'm here to tell you when your mind is a man has been filled with with worldly or secular or carnal images of what manhood is all about. Do you know that there's some men right now, you think that being a man is exercising physical force over a woman. If that's who you are and I'm talking to you, you're not a man. You're less than a man. If you feel like you have to assert your strength over a female, over a weaker vessel, by physically touching that woman, you've got some issues. I bet you won't put your hands on a man like that. But that's not the group of people I'm talking to today. I'm talking about the man God made, the husband God made, and the father God made. And as cultivators, that was our first job, to cultivate. And a part of cultivating is weeding, watering, and watching. And so what we're talking about right now is getting the weeds out of our mind as men, as husbands, as fathers, so that we can be the men that God is calling us to be. So here's how you get the weeds out of your mind, the fully out of your mind. Joshua chapter one and verse number eight, Joshua was getting ready to take over the leadership role that Moses left behind after he died. This was a daunting task, a task that I know that Joshua was afraid of because in every verse leading up to verse number eight, God kept telling him, be not afraid. Don't be afraid. But in Joshua chapter one and verse number eight, listen to this, this book of the law, shall not depart out of thy mouth. Why is that important? Man, husband, father, you have to start saying about yourself what the word of God says about you as a man, what the word of God says about you as a husband, what the word of God says about you as a father. And so he told Joshua, he said, if you want to have good success, if you want to keep the weeds out of your mind, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. Listen, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. Listen, this is the lost art among Christians, learning how to meditate, allowing God to speak to you in his word and not say anything back, finding a quiet place and closing your eyes and begin to see, to visualize yourself as the man that God says you are. Do you know I had to go? Listen, I'm not talking to you. I'm telling you about a process that I had to go through. I had to do a brain dump. I had to get all of that stuff, all of that foolishness, all of that carnal knowledge, all of that tramp tree stuff, all of the, the foolishness I heard from my friends and my peers. I had to do a brain dump and get all of that out because it was contrary to what the word of God says about the man, the husband and the father that I'm supposed to be. So he told Joshua, he said, meditate therein day and night that you might observe to do according to all that is written therein. And then he tells Joshua, he tells Joshua, this man, this husband, this father, he says, for then shall you make your way prosperous and then shall you have good success. And I'm talking to some man out there right now. You out here hanging around with your boys while you got a wife and a family and you're allowing them to put that foolishness in your head and tell you you're henpicked. And oh man, your old lady, your old girl won't let you go out. You better throw that foolishness away and detox. Listen, and begin to get the weeds out of your mind and allow the seeds of God's word to be planted in your mind so that you can be the husband, the father, and the man that your wife is looking for, that this nation is looking for, that this community is looking for. Do you know that the problems in this world are because the missing man, the man is gone. Where is the man? Where is the husband? 
Where is the father? And so that's what we're talking about this morning. Now, getting the weeds out of my mind, look at Genesis, not Genesis, but look at Romans chapter 12 and verse number two. Romans 12 and verse number two says, and be not conformed to this world. Talking about men as cultivators, getting the weeds out of your mind. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the word of God, that you might prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. So if I am going to be the man, the husband, and the father that God has called me to do, I've got to do some weeding. I've got to get some weeds out of my mind. I've got to reprogram the way that I think. I got to get some things down in my mind, get the weeds out, get some things down in my mind like this. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of waters, whose leaf shall not wither, and he shall bring forth his fruit in season, and everything that he does, it shall prosper. I don't need to be hearing what Jay-Z says about manhood. I don't need to be hearing what Drake says about manhood. I don't need to hear what some of the rappers are saying about manhood. I need to hear what the word of God says about being a man, being a husband, and being a father. And that means I've got to do some weeding in my mind. Amen and amen. Now, another place where I've got to get the weeds out, because remember, if you guys haven't caught up with this, I'm trying to review and bring you along. The first man that God made was placed in the garden, and he was told to take care of that garden, to cultivate it. We said, you've got a weed, you've got a water, and you've got to watch. Now, I got the weeds out of my mind. Another place that I have to get the weeds out is I have to get the weeds out of my heart. Go to Proverbs 4.23. Proverbs 4 and 23. Hallelujah. Proverbs 4 and 23 says this, keep thy heart with all diligence for out of it flow the issues of life. Keep thy heart with all diligence for out of it flow the issues of life. What does that have to do with me being the man that God made turning into the husband and the father that God made? Do you know how many men right now are dealing with father wounds that have wounded their hearts in such a way that their potential, their ability to develop into the man, the husband, and the father that God has called them to be, it's not going to happen because there's still weeds in the heart issue. Your father did. Listen, I never will uh, forget one young man. He, he passed away now, but we were talking once and we were in a counseling session and he told me, he said his father used to beat him um, when he was um, a young man. And I said, oh man, I, I got weapons too. I got weapons all the time. He said, no, pastor. He said, you don't understand. He said, my father used to physically hit me with his fist and beat me down and kick me when I was a boy, when I was a young man growing up. And guess how? Listen, that was a seed that was sown in his life. We're talking about getting the weeds out of your heart. That was down in his heart. Keep your heart with all diligence because out of it, whatever's placed in there, it's going to come out. Guess how that manifested in his life? He began to beat and physically abuse his wife. And I... As soon as we talked, as soon as he began to cry, as soon as he told me what had happened with his father, I could connect the dots. I could connect the dots. Keep your heart with all diligence, brothers, because out of it flow the issues of life. If you need to forgive somebody that hurt you when you were coming up, let it go. Listen, listen, that is just the devil trying to sabotage your future. Listen, and compromise your potential. You've got to get your heart right. If somebody wounded you or abused you, listen, brothers, if you are abused in another relationship, don't take that out on your current wife. Don't take that out on your children that you have right now. Listen, don't let what happened in your past hold your future hostage. And so he says, keep your heart. You've got to guard your heart. What happens a lot of times with men and with husbands and, and, and fathers is we bottle stuff up and we bottle it up so long in our hearts that we don't know how to release it. And when we do release it, it comes out in an ugly way. So brothers, keep your heart. Get rid of forgive. Listen, get rid of unforgiveness, any jealousy, any envy, any strife. Anything that happened to you as a young boy that was growing up, realize the devil saw your potential way back then. He, trust me, he saw your potential and he did something to try to stunt your growth and to try to compromise your potential. But I'm here to tell you there's power in the blood of Jesus Christ. If you will just pray and ask God, listen, God, I don't know how to release this person. 
I don't know how to forgive them for molesting me when I was a young man, when I was a young boy. I don't know how to forgive them for the painful things that they said to me. I don't know how to forgive them for physically abusing me. You have to take that to God and say, God, please give me grace to let this go. Why? Keep your heart with all diligence, brothers, because out of it flow the issues of life. The reason you're grumpy the reason you're always so harsh and so short and just jumping on people all the time is because you haven't resolved some issue that's there in your heart. And it's funny. We hurt the people that haven't hurt us because our hearts haven't healed. Let me say that again. Brothers, if you're not careful, you will hurt the people that haven't hurt you because you haven't dealt with that heart issue and gotten the weeds out of your heart. Amen. Do you know what? Let's, let, let me go back and share something with you. David, as a man, as a husband, as a father, when he made that huge mistake with Bathsheba in Psalms chapter 51, talking about getting the weeds out of his heart. Do you know what he said? He said, Lord, he said, create within me a clean heart and renew a right spirit with me. God, get the weeds out. Get the weeds of lust out. Get the weeds of lying out of my heart. Get the weeds of manipulation. Get the weeds of competition. Whatever weeds are in. God create within me a clean heart. Get the weeds out and renew a right spirit within me. So we said we've got to get the weeds out of our minds. We've got to get the weeds out of our heart. And you know what? We have to get the weeds out of our relationship. Brothers, listen. The first man was placed in a garden and God told Adam, cultivate it. Take care of it. Manage it. Anything you cultivate, you're going to have to weed, water, and watch. We said we've got to get the weeds out of our mind. Get the weeds out of our heart. Now, get the weeds out of our relationship. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 33. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Let me, come on. I, I said it, but you guys need to read it. Come on, let's get there. 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 15. And I think I said 33. 1 Corinthians 15. And, uh. And 33, getting the weeds out of your relationships. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Yes, we have to get the weeds, the things that are counterproductive out of our minds. Yes, we have to get the weeds and the things that are counterproductive, unforgiveness, jealousy, lust, all that stuff out of our hearts. But yes, we have to get the weeds out of our relationships. And that scripture just says, be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. If you read it in a different translation, it will say that you will take on the behavior of those people that you hang out with. Man of God, husband, father, who are you hanging out? What's the conversation like when you have boys night out? When the boys go out together, how many of your boyfriends, the, the guys that you got, go out with that are married, that love their wives, that appreciate and, and respect their wives and, and are always uplifting and saying positive things about their wives? Or are the guys in your fab five, are the guys in your relationship cheating on their wives? Are the guys in your fast five relationship, single guys who are telling you you're hen thick? Oh man, you, you gonna let her do you like that? Oh, all that kind of, listen. Some of the relationships that you can have as a man, as a husband and a father can be more damaging to you than beneficial. And so you have to be very, very careful who you hang out with. Look at Proverbs 13 and 20. Let's go there really quick. Bible says if you hang with wise people, you'll be wiser. Proverbs. Let's get there really quick. Proverbs. And we said 13 and 20. Proverbs 13 and 20. I hope this is blessing you guys. He that walks with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Oh, man, get the weeds out of your relationship. Brothers, let me tell you something. If you are a man, husband or father, especially if you are a husband and father, think about this. Who is that friend or those friends that you have that you can't bring around your wife, that you can't bring around your children, that you don't want to bring around your home? Think about that. Who are the men? that are in your life, that you, have that you have a relationship with, that you don't bring them to your home, you don't introduce them to your wife, you don't want them around your children. Well, guess what? If you don't want them in your home, don't want to bring them around your wife, don't want them around your children, maybe they shouldn't be around you. Oh, let's let that marinate for a while. 
Why don't you bring them to the house? You don't want their influence to be in your house. Why don't you bring them around your wife? They don't respect women. So why would you bring them around your wife? Don't want to bring them around your children. They think children are rug rats. They're a burden. They don't even pay their child support. Listen, if you have people like that in your life, dude, brother, bruh, let me tell you what you ought to do. If they can't come to those three places, your home, your wife, your children, they shouldn't be in your life either. That's a weed. I'm going to say it again, brothers. That is a weed. And I found out that as a man, if I am going to be the man, the husband and the father that God has created me to be, I have to protect the relationships that are in my life. I have to protect my anointing from certain relationships and from certain people. And so we talked about getting the weeds out. Now, amen. Now, another thing, you have to create an environment for what you want to see to grow. Think about this. If you are a man, remember God took Adam, he placed him in the garden. He said, your first job is the job of a gardener in paradise. Keep the weeds out. But you also have to create an environment that's conducive to what you want to see. Brothers, there are certain things that you have. Okay, let me, let me show you this. Matthew chapter 13, verse 31 and 32. Matthew 13, 31 and 32. All right. Another parable put he forth unto him, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds. But when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs, and becometh the tree, so that the birds of the air can come and lodge in the branches thereof. Brothers, whatever you want to see, you've got to sow into your life now what you want to see in the future. Can I share something with you when we talk about being a man? a husband and a father, and how important it is that we create an environment that we want to see. You have to understand something about ladies. Now, now I'm, I'm not talking about you gigolos. I'm not talking to you guys. I'm talking about husbands and fathers that are trying to please God and how important it is and how do you create an environment that you want to see in your home. You have to sow the seeds into your home, into your wife, into your children that will produce the harvest that you desire to see in your life. You see, if you, if you sow grievous words and angry words, it's just going to break their spirit. But when you sow good words and healthy words that build them and that encourage, it will produce the environment that you want to see. Man, husband, father, if you want to be wealthy, and, and please, don't, I don't want to hear any religious nut telling me something about uh, the love of, uh, listen, just, just take that someplace else this morning. But if you want to be abundantly supplied in this world, where you have enough to take care of yourself, your family, and to bless somebody else, you have to begin to sow the right financial seeds. You have to educate yourself on some financial things. Understand what investing is about. Understand what saving is all about. Understand Understand all of these things, retirement, raw soil, educate yourself as much as possible, because if you want to have a prosperous future, you have to learn how to manage your finances. If you want that woman to act right, you've got to learn how to manage your, man, let me tell you something. If you want to have a blessed time in Playland, I don't want to go in and tell you about what Playland is. Why don't you stop by the store and pick up some flowers for no good reason? Why don't you walk up to her one day in the kitchen while she's making some pancakes or something? Just just snuggle up to her and reach around her neck and just give her a little little peck on the neck and just 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 bite her ear and say, I love you, baby. Just walk. Man, let me tell you something. You have no idea the seeds that you have sown. You are now creating an environment. <laughs> you are now creating an environment for a harvest that you're going to receive later on tonight. The harvest may come in the afternoon. It all depends on, on what kind of seeds you sow. But anyway, you've got to learn. Listen, with your children, when you see that your child has potential, you have to learn how to put that child in an environment that is conducive for their potential to develop. Why? I'm creating an environment for the future that I want to see in my wife, in my children, in my home, in my finances, in my career. And so we have to be able to spot potential and then create the environment that's there so that the potential can develop. Nobody wants to come home to a hell hole. Nobody. Listen, it's no good when you're a man and you come home and you just sit the driveway. Just turn the music on and just sit there and wonder, man, I wish I had someplace else to go. It's no fun when you're a man, you're a husband and a father, and you don't go to bed because you're hoping your wife is asleep before you get in the bed because you just don't want to fuss. You tiptoe and 
getting in the bed, barely pulling the covers back. No, that's not the kind of environment that you want. Brothers, you have to learn how to create an environment. That's what a cultivator does. That's what a gardener does. Create an environment for what you want to see. I just got a big project done in the backyard. Before that project was ever done, I visualized. Th this is just the way that I am. It has worked for me 100% of the time. You have to have a vision. Write the vision down. Make it plain so that he that reads it can run with it. Though it tarry, wait for it. For it shall not lie. In due season it shall not speak. It shall speak. And so when you have this thing of creating an environment, you have to see it in your head before you see it in reality. And when I see things, what I see, I see a healthy family, healthy wife, healthy children, prosperous. That's what you have to see. And then once you see that, do everything that you can, you, you can possibly do to create an environment that will produce the desired outcome that you want to see. Meditation is critical to cultivation. Man, I thought I was going to get finished with this thing. Do y'all know it's 11 o'clock and I, I'm not even, I hadn't even gotten to the communicate part. We'll get to that. We'll get to that uh, on, on Thursday night. But let's talk about this. When we talk about cultivating, getting the weeds out of my mind, getting the weeds out of my heart, getting the weeds out of my relationship, and then learning how to create an environment that I want to see in my future. A key to all of that is meditation. Just gave you the scripture before, Joshua 1 and 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein. Now, it's important what you meditate on, because if you're a man, I can't be rocking back and closing my eyes and meditating on my neighbor's fine wife. No, that's not how it goes. You need to find and get the word of God down in your heart and begin to meditate. And I'm telling you, when you begin to meditate and you begin to visualize things and you begin to see you the way that God sees you and you begin to see your family and your wife, the way that God sees your family and your wife. I'm here to tell you, if you can keep that picture in front of your eyes and you will order your steps in the word of God, it won't be long before you will see the future that you saw in your mind that was painted on the tapestry of your imagination. Child of God, listen, I am out of time this morning, but we're going to jump back into this on Thursday because we talked about cultivating, but we have to talk about communicating because brothers, one of our weak areas is we don't know how to talk. We were good rappers when we were out in the field, when we had our players, listen, when we were playing the field, when we were running gun stick for fun, listen, we knew how to rap. We had a mat and now all of a sudden, huh? What'd you say? So we're going to talk about communicating. And then the last thing we're going to talk about, I must cultivate, I must communicate, and I must care. And caring as a husband and a father involves a couple of things. Caring involves, number one, you've got to pray. The Bible says Job prayed for his family. Two, you become the protector. You watch out for your family. Three, you become the provider for your family. And four, you become the guide of your family. That's how you show you care. And we will get into that Thursday night. Thank you so much for tuning in to today's virtual broadcast at the River of Life Christian Center of Orlando, Florida. Big shout out to all you fathers out there. I think you guys are the best. And right now, if we were at the River of Life Christian Center, do you know we'd be shouting? Our hands would be up in the air. And speaking of being at the River of Life Christian Center, and speaking of being at the River of Life Christian Center, guess what? We will be back next week at 10 o'clock a.m. Please stop by the website, rolcc.tv, and register. We need to know if you're coming by yourself, if you're coming with family members. We want to prepare for you, and we want to prepare the safest and the cleanest environment that we possibly can so that given the circumstances that we have right now, that we can experience the best possible worship experience that we can have together. And so again, go by the website, register rolcc.tv. Hey, and then don't forget to join me tonight. You know, tonight at eight o'clock, I'll send out a call them all. We get together on our Facebook group page, River of Life Christian Center, Facebook group page, and we're going to talk about how do we come back. Well, pastors, I know the number's going crazy. I know all of that, but trust me, everything is going to be all right. 
If I didn't know and feel in my heart and believe that everything was going to be all right, we wouldn't be coming back. So we'll share more information with you tonight at eight o'clock on the River of Life Facebook page when we do a live broadcast. Deborah will be here with me and we're just going to talk to you guys and, and entertain your questions and suggestions as we prepare to return to the River of Life Christian Center. For those of you that support our ministry, thank you. I don't have the words to say thank you enough. That was one of my biggest concerns when this happened. I thank God we've been able to take care of our staff and their families. We've been able to do ministry every single week. We are feeding thousands of people. You don't see me put up on our website. That's something we don't brag. We, we just do what we do and we do it quietly. Still taking care of our ministry work down in Haiti. Still doing that. Listen, still in the middle of a ministry acquisition, we should be acquiring and starting our new site in Palm Bay. You're going to hear some information about that really, really soon. So, so blessed and excited about that. And again, you'll hear more information about that soon. Again, thank you guys for tuning in today. Now, if you are here and you have not decided to make Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, you are going to make millions of decisions in your life. I can tell you, and I can say this with confidence, the most important decision that you will ever make is the decision that affects eternity and where you will spend eternity. The Bible says it's appointed to man once to die and then the judgment, and we all will have to stand before God. Paul also says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Listen, I want you to have a right relationship with Jesus. Do you know how much he loved you? He loved you so much that before you ever committed your first sin, because he knew what you were going to do, he decided to pay the price that justice demanded. He took on flesh. The Bible says that he went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. But God took our sin, your sin, my sin, placed it on him and placed his righteousness on those of us who believe. And now we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, not because we do everything right, not because we're so good, because we simply cried out to him and said, Lord, and said, Lord, save us. And the word of God that says, says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, they shall be saved. Listen, if you've made that decision, we would love to hear from you and give you some free material that will help you get started on this brand new journey of faith. Please drop us a line at info, I-N-F-O, at R-O-L-C-C dot TV, and we will get that information in your hands. Hey guys, thanks a lot for tuning in with us at our virtual broadcast. Hey dads, enjoy your day to day. Even those bad Father's Day gifts that you got. That screwdriver that you got from China that fell apart, enjoy that screwdriver. That, that grill tool that when you look at it, you can't figure it out, enjoy that grill tool. I'm here to tell you, it is your day. God bless. See you guys on Thursday.